Hi, my name is Moria Amit, and I'm the Center's Senior Genealogy Librarian. Thank you all for joining us today. I want to extend a special thank you to all of our international viewers. I know there are people viewing from a number of different countries around the world, including Israel, France, uh, Germany, and England, and among others. Um, so thank you so much for staying up late to be with us. This is a part of the Center for Jewish History's Family History Today series of public programs. And just a little bit about the Center for Jewish History before we get started. The Center provides a collaborative home for five partner organizations, which include the Leo Beck Institute, which you'll hear a lot more about soon. And these, these organizations together form the largest archive in the U.S. on the modern Jewish experience. In addition, the center houses the Ackman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute, which is where I am based. And this provides access to a wealth of genealogical resources through its reference library, online databases, research guides, and our expert referrals to the primary sources within our partners' collections. At the Institute, we strive to make family history accessible to researchers of all ages, abilities, and levels of experience, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. While the center remains closed, our genealogy librarians, myself included, are still working remotely and are eager to assist you in your research. You may continue to engage with us in a number of ways, which I will now describe. You uh, can watch our uh, weekly genealogy coffee break webinars which air every Tuesday at 3 30 p.m. Eastern time on our Facebook page. We also provide uh, free genealogy workshop group, uh, workshops to um, various community groups from senior centers to synagogues to uh, genealogical groups. So if you are a member of one of those groups feel free to get or a leader of one of those groups feel free to get in touch with us to find out more about scheduling one of those workshops for your group. And uh, we are always available by email to answer your questions. Our email is gi, as in genealogy institute, at cjh.org. We are also available for more intensive one-on-one -on -one Zoom consultations as necessary. I hope you had a chance to see some of our upcoming programs in the slideshow that played before we got started today. Um, if you want to learn more about these or other future programs, you may sign up for our email list at bit.ly forward slash cjhe news. Or you can check out our program calendar at any time at programs.cjh.org. And before I uh, delve into um, the, the uh, introduction of our speaker today, I just want to make a few quick technical notes. You may have noticed that your microphones have been muted and that the chat box has been disabled. To send us your questions or comments, please use the Q&A box, which you should find on either the right side or the bottom of your screen. And please note that our guest speaker, along with two of her colleagues, will be answering your questions during the dedicated Q&A period at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Karen Franklin, who graciously offered to give her this presentation that she's been working on for, for quite a while. And she's, um, I know it's a very uh, near and dear to her heart. Um, so I really appreciate her sharing uh, what she's about to share with you, which is very personal. And um, anyway, so thank you, Karen, for, for, for that and for being such a um, wonderful collaborator. Karen Franklin is the directory, Director of Family Research at the Leo Beck Institute. She is also the co-founder and president of the Jury of the Oberman German Jewish History Awards. And previously, she served as the co-chair of the Jewish Gens, of Jewish Gens Board of Governors and as president of the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies, from which she received a Lifetime Achievement Award. So um, please take it away, Karen. Um, thank you, Moria. Thank you, JD, Frank, Michael, my colleagues, and also my friends all over the world who are tuning in, my 
colleagues all over the world, my cousins all over the world. Uh, it means a great deal to me that, that you're joining us today and I hope to make it worth your while. I wanna start with a very personal story that um, explains in many ways why um, I've always been interested in my family history and why particularly in donating uh, the collections that we'll be talking about today. Um, when I was um, 20 years old, uh, I'm sorry, 20 years ago or so, I had a really terrible nightmare, a, a lifelong upsetting event. I woke up in bed, sat up straight up in tears because I had this dream that my grandfather, who had died when I was eight years old, was still alive. And it was, and I did not know it. I had not known it. It was a really paralyzing dream to imagine someone that you might have had a relationship with uh, and no longer had the opportunity. It was just a, a terrible dream. And um, that's really a little bit behind what this story is about. And um, the, the second half of this story, which we'll be talking about today, is um, as a recipient of collections at the Leo Beck Institute for many years. Um, so, so there's an experience that we've had, Frank, many times, I'm sure, I, all those of our staff members who received collections, which is when someone comes in and wants to give them your life story, um, it's a privilege and an honor to listen to it, to receive the donations, to understand the value that someone is entrusting with you. And uh, it, many times um, I, I explain the situation, Dr. No situation. That is that um, you, someone is, you're trying to speed someone up because it's many hours after lunch and the person tells every single story. And as much as you'd like to hurry them, you realize that this is a special moment in their lives. They are telling you who they are and we always listen and entrust it. And I'm sorry to say you're stuck today and I hope that you don't feel that it's a, a Dr. No Doctor Who, Doctor No story that uh, you, you can't move your arms. There's nothing you can do about it. But here we go in this. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen with you. To begin, I, I want to mention uh, one special guest in particular who's with us today, and that is Mariana Salinger, 96 years old, young. This is her first Zoom call in her life. And I think that's very special. And you'll be seeing why in, in just a few moments. So today I'll be talking about several areas about how you select an institution that you want to give your family papers to. And I should mention, I'm going to be talking today about family papers, that, things that you inherited. But in terms of um, donating collections, it could also be your research papers. And this would apply to, to that as well. So how do you select what the Center for Jewish History and the Leo Beck Institute are? our policies, how you prepare your papers to be donated. And then I'm going to tell you all those family secrets about my family that I learned that maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. So in order to uh, select a place to donate your papers, uh, you might want to think about a number of things. Um, it do, do your papers relate to the mission of the institution to whom you're donating? Uh, do they have the capacity and ability to keep those papers safe? Uh, is the material accessible? Not only uh, might it be digitized and available online, but will people know to go there to find it? Um, and will it be well described by the archivists who make, who make it accessible? Are there knowledgeable staff persons who can help researchers when they're looking for your papers? And if you don't know what institution might be a good match for your material, uh, you might look on the Jewish Gen Discussion Group list or any other genealogy discussion group list. This is just an example from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum putting out a call for material on the discussion group list several years ago. Now, I'm going to presume that most of you, because you learned about this through the Center for Jewish History or are New Yorkers or wherever you are in the world, may already be familiar with the Center, its partner institutions, three of them uh, mostly archival institutions. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. And just very briefly, I'll talk about the Leo Beck Institute directly. If you have additional questions about the Institute or partners, we certainly have the staff people here, Michael, 
and Frank and Moria and JD can answer questions for you as well. Uh, we should mention that currently the center is closed to the public. Uh, staff at Leo Beck Institute are working from home. We don't know exactly when uh, it will open to researchers again, but we do hope that you will check back if you are interested in coming in. Um, but uh, the center is one of the best institutions uh, in the world in terms of having information about its collections available on its digital catalogs, which you can get on the website cjh.org. The component institutions include the American Jewish, Arch uh, American Jewish Historical Society, which uh, collects exactly what it sounds like it collects, the Evo Institute for Jewish Research, which is East European Jewry, and of course, the Leo Beck Institute. Founded in 1955 by Rabbi Leo Beck, the last major rabbinic leader presence in, uh, in Germany before uh, the Second World War. Uh, and the purpose, it was, um, it was in, uh, came into being in order to collect and preserve material from refugees. Uh, and I want to also mention that currently the Institute also collects a great deal of uh, German Jewish historical material from the United States from the late 19th century, 19th century, early 20th century. So it's not just for refugees that you might seek to donate your papers or look for papers. If your family came earlier, we have material as well. And this is famous Rabbi Leo Beck himself. Now, what kind of materials do we collect? Um, you can read the description in front of you, but I will just tell you as a genealogist, some of the most important materials are not only the family trees, but the community histories and also memoirs. Because even if you have nothing from your own family, a memoir by someone who came from the same town or same area can give great context to what your family might have lived through or lived like uh, when they were in the same place. Now, our archival collections. Uh, Michael Simonson, uh, whose uh, PowerPoint presentation this is based on, has put together a lovely few slides just talking about the kinds of archival materials we have in our collections. And I will just run through them for you. What I find rather humorous is that many of these collections contain the same types of materials. It's, it's almost as if those German Jews had a list of what they collected. They collected diplomas and report cards and uh, driver's licenses, naturalization material, letters, all, but many of them quite similar material, but of course, each one is unique. And we collect not only uh, things from famous families, but also your everyday lifetime stories are equally of interest, particularly if you're the person looking and it's your family or you're donating and it's your family story. We also have 80, over 80,000 books in the collection, not just academic books, but also family histories, community histories, uh, every type of work, diaries, memoirs uh, in our collection. And we have a wonderful art and objects collection, which uh, as you can imagine, can have great relevance to uh, genealogy collections. They're, they're um, portraits of people, ancestors. And this particular one I like because it's from the late 19th century uh, in San Francisco. So within this art collection is a really wonderful piece. It's a wimple. It's um, a cloth from which a child was uh, circumcised in and it's later refashioned into a Torah binder. And uh, the entire wimple you can see at the bottom of your screen, um, it's it, quite long. It has a certain phrase that's repeated in, in all of the objects, and all of the wimples. And this particular one, as you can see, has a family tree in it and even maps of the towns where the family came from and even uh, a picture of what I presume is a home uh, in one of the towns that the family came from. So it's just a rather delightful uh, piece with great relevance to us. And Michael also <laughs> collected this great slide of what we don't collect, which are uh, basically general books, German history books, German literature. Uh, every Jewish family had a Goethe and a Schiller. And uh, I particularly love this slide that Michael collected because uh, I, I wish you were in front of me as an audience and I could say, what is wrong with this picture? 
oh, what's wrong with this picture? Um, of course, we don't collect apples at the Leo Beck Institute, and we certainly don't put them with our books. This is what we do with our collections at the Leo Beck Institute. They're stored properly according to archival standards, uh, preserved climate control, disaster plan, security, and conservation if, uh, if required. Now, when you donate your collection to the Leo Beck Institute, who uses them? Because that informs how, in fact, we would uh, consider what to collect, what to keep. And the people you might imagine, the um, <clears throat> genealogists, community historians, uh, scholars, but also a number of scholars in Germany uh, uh, access our collections. And in fact, I answer many inquiries with regard to um, uh, Stolpersteine, memorial plaques and stones. Uh, people are looking for the descendants and more information about the people who perished. And uh, they may be looking for things you may not even be thinking of. And we, this is always a great challenge for a, an archivist as to what to save. <clears throat> And I have a story. Uh, uh, when I was in Alaska some years ago on a museum field trip, we went to the Anchorage, Alaska Natural History Museum associated with the university and got a tour about how they preserve birds. They had a, a world known bird collection of stuffed birds. And the curator told us that over the years, for decades, they would save every part of the bird except for the stomach because they really had no use for it and there was no way they could preserve it. So, but the rest of the birds they had. Well, unfortunately today, the stomachs would be of the most interest because it tells uh, where, where the contents polluted. Is the diet different than it is today? And all different other questions that a scientist might ask that cannot be answered today and so therefore we're not we don't really know what scholars will be looking for in the future they probably won't come to the leo beck institute looking for bird guts but what the relevant or comparable collection might be um, i can also tell you that i've done work at columbia university library for refugee materials and people would would write to the lehman family that i'm studying and send a family tree as to how they were related and whoever the archivist was at the um, at the library took out all the family trees and tossed them so there's all these letters that say the family tree is attached and none is attached so or few are attached so we try and and keep as much material as we can because we don't know what people will be looking for in the future now i thank the staff of Leo Beck Institute for assisting me uh, in answering some of your questions ahead of time and offering some advice uh, for if you are interested in donating your papers to the Leo Beck Institute. Um, Frank has, uh, has uh, several statements that are of importance in this regard. He suggests not only uh, we don't know what will be requested in the future, but also he suggests that a narrative come along with the collection. That is, and you'll see from the material that I will be uh, um, discussing, if you're donating your papers, it really helps to, to know your understanding and the meaning for you of the papers that you are donating. Um, and also Frank touched in his remarks and can, can answer uh, after, the, after my talk, about confidential material. And I will, and he suggests that some of it can be shielded, can be kept by the Institute, but not necessarily made public. And I'd like to tell you a story because I, I think it's really interesting and relevant of a family that I, uh, uh, papers I worked on of a college professor and the wife of the college professor wrote, and this letter is in the archives, that her husband had better stop his activities with all those young girls. He does not want to hear about any more of them. And it occurred to me that that could be today used in a completely different way than, it, than the donation had been intended. So I would really encourage you, uh, if there is real material that's really difficult, even, uh, uh, sorry, Frank, you may disagree with me about this, but you might want to think twice about um, donating it or at least think, think about restricting its access. 
Um, now, in terms of what we don't know what future uh, researchers will be interested in, I want to point to one of the papers that I am donating. The, the reason this all came about, uh, this talk and this activity, is because I started arranging my own papers at the beginning of COVID and um, got quite into it and wanted to um, talk about the process. And one of the things I found was a letter from 1945. My father had served in the United States military to having come from Germany in the early 1930s. And he wrote to his parents, many of his letters were very couched uh, because that, the information must have been quite difficult. But he wrote about going to family uh, that was still in Frankfurt, his cousin who was one of the few Jews left in Germany. And uh, he sent back the message to his grandmother that his grandmother's sister had died. And uh, that, that would be uh, Rosa and Nellie were deceased in the deportation. This cousin had been able to survive because she had married a non-Jew. And what I didn't realize until I did my research was that the children from her marriage, actually, they were two of Hitler's Jewish soldiers. They actually served in the German army. And when their Jewish background became, had been discovered, um, they were set into positions that were non-battle uh, non um, parts of the army. But I don't know that anyone really thought about, and I don't know how they were told that their own grandmother was murdered. Renata Avers, the director of collections, had the following suggestions for someone who is interested in uh, giving a collection. She wants you first to know that we are not open to accept material at this moment, which doesn't mean you shouldn't start working on it, just that you can't donate it right this minute. Um, our staff at the Leo Beck Institute, we are all working from home diligently, harder than when we were in the office. And there are many things we can do in terms of um, cataloging and creating exhibitions and many other activities. But going through the collections themselves is not something that we're currently doing at home. And, and again, on the website, it will give instructions uh, for when we will be opening to actually accepting collections and how that can be done. <clears throat> Herman Typer, uh, the head archivist, asked that when you donate a collection that you please make sure it is one collection at one time and not little dribs and dabs, bits and pieces. This helps to keep it really coherent. Uh, and also, uh, and, and this is a, a very, uh, important part, how much what it should be curated by the donor. Um, if it should come completely organized or if you just ship it to us and get it out of your house. And there's something to be said for, for each of the ways it might be sent. Uh, Michael Simonson, uh, Frank had many stories about people they were going to donate as soon as they got it ready. Yeah, they just had to do a few more things and we never saw the collection. So if someone is thinking to organize a collection and send it to us and the organizing part is not possible, of course, just send it. Um, but there are advantages to having the opportunity to work on the collection that you will see. Um, Herman suggests that you send a family tree with your collection uh, and so we can print it out. Which leads to the question of digital, of donating collections that are already digitally available and uh, these questions you can ask to Frank and Michael, but there are also for this instructions on the website. Michael also is our man to help you access the collections. Um, when when uh, people come to me, uh, would come to me and uh, as I told you in the beginning to give them their collections, they might walk in the door and say, my name is so-and-so Oppenheim. And my answer would be, I know who you are. And Frank would say, I know who you are. And Michael would say, I know who you are, not you, but your family. Uh, German Jews, as all Jews in the world, many Jews in the world were dislocated during the Second World War. And people don't know who they are. But uh, when one comes to the Leo Beck Institute, uh, I might know where they came from. Frank might know 
the context of their entire family history, Michael might know exactly where in the collection there's already material to assist them or to show them for their family research. Dr. William Weitzer, our boss, also has something to say for potential donors. Uh, this will come no, to no surprise to you, but he also acknowledges the importance to each individual of the family collection. And knowing that, uh, it, also stresses the importance of making sure that that collection is properly cared for by making a donation. And as you will see, I have actually helped you all with this by indicating the level of support that might be helpful uh, in terms of, of processing your collection. I also put here a family tree just to give you an example of how I, how I have been and, and might be additionally uh, sending material in with the collection that, I, uh, that I'm working on. I did something really stupid and I put my birth date on this, so we'll just go right past that one. Uh, but I also, in the notes that I've written, so accompany my collection, and in addition to organizing the collection, uh, I wrote notes about what was the most important to me. And among the things that were most important uh, in my father's um, collection of record of letters from the war, my dad um, was trained during the army in nuclear physics with the expectation that he would be working on the bomb in Los Alamos or in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And for various reasons, he was sent instead to Europe. But he received letters, many letters from people with whom he trained. And one of them was most interesting and said, uh, you remember how the professor said it was such a big opportunity to be working here. Uh, well, it's not what he said it was. And I think someone who's reading this material might be really helped by being able to identify the, the important, uh, most important letters from it. Also, um, I included in the files of family collection uh, a number of letters. And just by themselves, these letters to my family, uh, it may, may not be so interesting, but I listed who it was, uh, in fact, that um, each of these people uh, that this was from. Did I? Yes. And, and this is what the collection looks like uh, in my home. Uh, you can get uh, imagine uh, the approximate size. There's actually uh, quite a bit more um, that I haven't included here. But this material is um, is begins in 1840 with a passport and goes through restitution papers after the war. Some of it is divided in boxes by uh, documents and letters in Germany than in the United States. My father's letters from the Second World War. Uh, individual correspondence, my father, my father's mother's family, my father's father's family, and so on. Oh, let's see. Um, it, to, to give you a, a little hint of what's inside the boxes, there is a box about the immig their immigration. And I mentioned that these families uh, all seem to have the same material. I think for many of you, just even looking in this one file of the family coming to the United States, you will see um, things that you recognize. They kept every single menu from every single um, uh, meal on the ship. And, and these actually represent several passages back and forth to the United States. Uh, notification when they arrived, a letter asking when they would arrive, and so on and so forth. Now, the uh, important part here, the, uh, the family stories of my own family, uh, what I learned during this, during this process. Uh, I'll start with my great-grandfather, Herman Plotchek. We named our cat Herman when we were growing up for this grandfather, great-grandfather, my grandmother's father, who came to the United States in 1934. Uh, my son, uh, Josh, when he was in high school, at the very beginning of um, Photoshop, you may remember it, uh, transplanted his great-grandfather's uh, suit and beard and mustache and glasses onto himself uh, so that he could become a part of the family, so to speak. Well, that Herman Plotchek, 
Uh, we had always been told that he was a gymnast by my mother, but we all never understood what a gymnast, what, what it meant to be a gymnast in Berlin in the early 20th century. But as I was going through my family papers, preparing them uh, to give to the Leo Beck Institute, I found in this rather boring pile of congratulatory letters when my grandparents got married in 1919, I found a letter from his gym club, uh, not exactly what you would call New York sports club today or Equinox or something. It was much more of a, of a club than just a gym space. But this uh, congratulatory letter gave me the name of the institution. And uh, Michael Simonson can tell you all about, uh, if anyone is interested in what these clubs were, he happens to be quite an expert in it. Um, and so now I can really place that family story actually was true. He was a member of a gym and uh, probably won until he was kicked out uh, before he came to the United States. Possibly, I, I don't know. Uh, there are more research to be done. His son, my grandfather, my grandmother's brother, uh, we knew very little about. He died as a very young man, tragically, and I found a photo of him in this material. I had not known that a photo of him existed. And the reason this uh, was so, so important was when I sent it to my oldest son, Ross, he sent me a message back and he said, how did you do that? How did you make my photo into a 19th century photo? How did you do that? Um, usually my kids say, mom, if you send me one more photo and say someone looked like someone else, I am not talking to you because I do it so often. But in this case, they actually took it quite seriously. Uh, this is my son Ross, and though I don't think you can see it in this particular photo, the connection between the way they look is, is striking. It's even more striking because uh, there's 90 years between them. It's Ross's great grandfather, great grandmother's brother. It's not exactly like an uncle or, or so. And um, to have this, he doesn't look like anybody else in the world. He doesn't look like any of his brothers. It was one of those, I knew it, well, only I could, I knew it, what, that he wasn't, uh, didn't look like the postman because I'm telling you, he didn't look like the postman. But um, in, in this case, it's very moving that now he, because of this research I did, he knows who he looks like. I also have my grandmother's uh, photograph from school. She's on the left-hand side, uh, to the far left in the second um, row, and to the far right, the last person on the right is her friend, Truda Ginsburg, who is Mariana Solinger's mother. And this is a wonderful photo because it has the names of each of the girls on the back. And I can only imagine that someone going through that Leo Beck Institute uh, file sometime in the future is going to be thrilled to see the name. It also means that children in Germany could research what happened to the fates of all of these women uh, who went to school in 1913. Another letter I found in this very boring, if you think that, that congratulations in the marriage, uh, for the marriage was boring, well, congratulations for the wedding was even larger. But there was one that really threw me. Uh, this, this was um, a message, a letter to my grandfather. And um, it was from uh, 1922. And it was from the director of a foundation for the deaf and dumb. Uh, now, those of you who know me, and many of you do, know that I am legally deaf and uh, I have a cochlear implant. And so to find that my grandfather had a relationship or given money, I don't know what his relationship with this institution was. Maybe he just knew the director, but it looks like a rather formal letter. So this begins, makes me ask the question, is, is my um, handicap actually congenital? Did it come from my grandfather's side of the family? Why would he have received a letter of congratulations from someone for a society for the deaf? And finally, um, the recordings. Um, a little bit of my family story and the importance. I, finding these records as part of this process uh, is one of the most fascinating research explorations I've ever had. Uh, and I think 
perhaps unique. And if any, if you know of any other family who has something like this, I'd be very interested to hear. Um, the idea of going to a recording studio for a regular family, not, not if it's a musical group or, or an orchestra or something, but people going to a fair or to a department store and recording their own voices only began in the not late um, 1920s, early 1930s. And my family did this. But what made it unique was they sent these recordings back and forth from Europe. Uh, and when they were saved. And they, they tell so many things more than just what the voices sounded like. For example, um, this one, when my, my grandfather uh, in 1930 came to the United States, he got a job here. He had been born in England, so he, he spoke English. Um, and he came to the United States to get a job and then he sent for my grandmother and my grandparents to come and they arrived a year and a half later. During that time, my grandfather, uh, my, my father sent uh, records to his father and we have them and we can hear his voice as a, as a six year old, seven year old in German. Uh, and then in 1934, my grandfather turned 50 and his family still in Nazi Germany in Hamburg sent him a recording uh, wishing him a happy birthday. Among those who, gave, who spoke, uh, well, I'd like you to hear the recording first. Among those who spoke was my great grandmother who had been born in 1860 and you were about to hear her voice and uh, her other grandchildren, my, my father's cousins. And uh, you can listen to the little clip, I hope. Um, could you, I haven't been looking at the questions and answers, but could you text me if you cannot hear this? How do you do, Mr. and Mrs. Gatrick? You shouldn't think I only know how to speak German. I know how to speak English, that's the same. I hope you will understand me. Now I'm a, a born maker. I'm talking to you here. I'm going to want to make a story party. Look at the lecture I hope you could hear the voice. Um, he's, he's saying, how do you do, Mr. and Mrs. Plachuk? But you didn't know I could speak English. Um, and I'm talking to you on a recording machine and I'm going to the toy department to see the electric trains. What was shocking about hearing my father's voice uh, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I realized I told you the wrong thing. There, there are four recordings. The first one was from my, my father to, uh, to his father, United States. This is the second one, not from 1934. This is the second one from 1932. When he uh, came to, the, my father came to the United States, and then he sent this recording back to Germany, where his grandparents were still, were still there. The third recording is from 1934. Well, this is my father sending this back to his family in Germany, talking about how he was learning English. And the remarkable thing is that you can hear his British accent. Uh, he had a German-British accent because his father had been born in England, so he learned English with a British accent, which he eventually lost. I apologize for that, for, for going out of order. How do you do? Oh, wait a second. This is the next one. Uh, this is the 1934 recording sent from Germany to the United States with the voices of my, so to the far left is uh, my grandfather's brother, his mother, then my grandfather, and these two cousins, Helen and Robert. And uh, these are the voices you will hear, my, my uncle and my great grandmother, um, and uh, wishing my grandfather a happy birthday and my great grandmother was born in 1860. So very briefly. So what's amazing about this is the uh, translation of this was done uh, by my, by Mariana Salinger, who knew my great grandmother who was born 
1860. And the records themselves, of course, like I don't have a record player that I could just play them on. There was an expert by the name of uh, Seth Winner who re-recorded all of these for me to make them available. He used multiple different needles and, and equipment and acoustics in order to capture these voices. Now, what makes this amazing, this, this voice of my great grandmother, to give you a sense of who she was, there's a wonderful document that will soon go into the Leo Beck Institute. It's a yard site calendar, um, and uh, it's from uh, my, it's for my great great grandmother who died in 1940 uh, in 18. I'm sorry, my great great grandmother who died in 1898, and the calendar is a 50 year calendar. It goes to 1948, uh, and it was kept by my great grandmother born in 1860. Uh, if you notice, uh, of those 50 years, almost all of them are marked off. My great grandmother kept this calendar that she uh, observed the yard sites for all of those years, except for one. And if you look very carefully, you can see that in 1939, the date is not crossed out. And the reason most likely is because that was the date she came to the United States uh, right after uh, her arrival, the yard site uh, came and I suspect she was busy uh, acclimating to her new country. Also from this, we can tell that they were liberal Jews because in here it says that uh, her ashes were buried. Now I know how important this paper was to her because this is a list of everything that she brought with her uh, in 19, uh, when she arrived in this country in 1939, and she didn't bring very much. So that little piece of paper must have been great value to her. Uh, the last recording I'd like to tell you about is um, from my father in 1943, when he served in the American army and he was in basic training in Camp Croft. And uh, in South Carolina, you can see the horrible uh, condition that this recording is in. And so it, when you hear it, it it's, um, it's a little broken up, but you can hear my, my father's no longer speaking with a German and a British accent. Uh, and there's a big surprise to this. It, uh, the recording was uh, for his parents and his grandparents, uh, but it was sent um, via um, Mrs. J. Spiegel, care of Mrs. W. Salinger. That's Mariana Salinger's parents. And if you listen very carefully in the recording, he, he first uh, wishes he, um, the Salingers well in this recording. So listen carefully, and then he wishes his mother a happy birthday. I suppose you've been hearing this record over at Salinger. So I want to take this opportunity to send them my best regards. I really didn't get a chance to write you a full birthday letter, Mother. So, I'm glad I can get a chance to say it. And here's a happy birthday and a pleasant year ahead. It's, it's an amazing recording. I don't think it really sounds like him all that much, uh, but uh, considering that the how long the record has last, we feel lucky to have it. Um, if you note on here, uh, you can see my father's photo. Um, from basic training from Camp Croft. He's the one who's holding the tips of the flag. He's directly under the flag. And uh, there's the photo of him that you saw before. And if you look to the left to see my father in basic training, uh, notice there's a difference between the two photos of about 20 pounds or so that he lost in basic training. And I'll skip very quickly to uh, the end of the war, just the envelope itself uh, from June of 1945 uh, tells you how my father traveled through Europe and, and how the, uh, took a little while for the mail to catch up to him, finally caught up to him uh, in the post-war period in, when he was uh, a student in Paris. And finally, uh, I wanna go back to what I said in the very beginning and read to you one uh, from one letter that my father received from his father when he was in the field hospital wounded. He was wounded on Thanksgiving in 1944. Uh, and his father wrote him the following statement. Uh, we can only understand 
we can understand only too readily how sometimes you must feel overcome by homesickness. Wouldn't be natural if during the night in an uncomfortable foxhole in the front lines, you would not feel a longing for the comforts of home. And when you write that your life at home has given you something endurable that gives you comfort in such cases, well, such a statement is for mother and me a source of great inner satisfaction. At all times, it has been our desire to make you feel yourself a full-fledged member of our little family community, not an object of education, as is the case in so many families. We wanted to make out of you a self-reliant and independent-feeling man, and if we have succeeded in that, we are more than pleased. So uh, my grandfather, he really is still alive. And I'm still learning from him. And there will be more to come when I finish reading through those lectures, uh, letters and when I finish with my notes and my gift to the Leo Beck Institute to my family. And I hope to you. So now we are going to open it up to questions. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank you again, Karen, for that really illuminating talk and for sharing your personal stories with us, including that um, letter that I know was, was difficult for you to read, but um, I think it, it, was, it resonated with a lot of people here. Um, so thank you. All right, so let's get started with some questions specifically for Karen. Let's see. Deborah Nussbaum Cohen uh, was curious to learn, how did your family papers survive the war? Um, it's a good question. So the family came over in the 1930s, and so they were able to bring uh, a lot of stuff with them. My grandmother died when I was six, and my grandfather moved into the house with us. And when he died uh, just a, a few years later, everything was already in the house. So I grew up with all these papers. I, I actually looked at them when I was a kid. And then uh, my father went to assisted living on several years before he, he died. And at that time, then everything came to our house. So nothing was gone through. No one decided to keep this and throw that. It was all there. So we really have this uninterrupted history and we're very blessed to have it. Yeah, certainly, um, it, it, it's rare to see to see yeah. such a, a depth it is. of material, um, including recordings. Um, yeah, it's pretty special. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. Okay. A lot of the questions are specific to. Um, Leo Beck Institute. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Po like uh, collection policy. So I'll start with that. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I can. I know the answer to this question, but I'll throw it out to to you and on the staff. Um, anyway, um, do you accept actual artifacts like, for example, this? A uh, person asks her great grandmother or her grandmother's mother of pearl covered prayer book. Frank, would you like to answer the question? I'm happy to, but you may answer better. Um, in terms of artifacts, please um, let, let us discuss case by case uh, because we are not a museum and uh, we only in exceptional cases. Uh, do accept objects, but uh, um, some objects are more significant uh, when they are in connection with the papers. And so that is a matter then of personal discussion. And also what is important with the objects is the story that is behind it. So um, even before you're thinking about it, please um, write down uh, what you remember and uh, uh, which is a general thing, uh, you always know more about these things than the papers can tell. Mm -hmm. Yes, these, these things that you are, a uh, good point, Frank, the things that you're donating, um, they, they all have a context and you, and, and you can really help um, future 
researchers, future members of your family even that come to look at these things by providing some of the stories behind those objects and, and letters and things like that. So thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, can I, can yeah, I answer ahead, Karen. that here? Because it, it, it struck me very deeply. Why donate if you have an attachment to the objects and they're very important to you? Yeah. And, and um, so the, there are many answers to that question. Uh, the, the easiest one is if it's very important to you, you uh, might not want to donate if you're still working with it or if, it, if it's very meaningful. Um, but after the, the fires in uh, California, um, it, it's clear that not everything uh, may be as, as safe with you as, uh, as you might think. So um, that's, that's certainly one reason. Uh, I, I, have, um, I am donating at this time because I know that um, if something were to happen to me, I know exactly where all the material would land. And I know that even though my, my sons aren't particularly interested in this, I, my grandchildren may be someday. So preserving the material at the Leo Peck Institute um, so we'll preserve it for them when they are ready for it and better they should have it available uh, than, than not at all. So. Um, thank you. Um, the next question is, if you have only copies of documents and the originals are either non-existing or their whereabouts are unknown, will the institution accept these items, meaning the copies? Frank? Is Michael there? Do we know if Michael? Um, I've asked him to unmute, but um, I'm not sure if his microphone is. Yeah, I'm here, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I can answer if you want. Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, hi, I'm Michael Simonson. And uh, we would accept, we do accept paper copies. We prefer to have originals, but of course we will take copies if uh, there are reasons we are not able to receive the originals. For example, the case being described, obviously, but also we understand that people might want to hold on to originals for various other uses. We would hope to, uh, in that case, to receive the originals someday in the future, but we, we can work with photocopies until that time. Thanks. Well, I should say one, one reason we do prefer originals is it's easier to work with issues of um, reproduction and copyright, whereas copies are already copies, and sometimes it becomes unclear. But this, this is a legal thing that wouldn't really affect 99.9% .9 of donors, you know. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, another question has come in about family trees specifically um, and about um, the privacy considerations that may go along with um, making those available digitally. How does the Leo Beck Institute deal with um, digitization of family trees that may contain living individuals? Does anybody want to talk about that? About, about the privacy, about that privacy concern? Yep, Frank? Oh. I have to unmute you. <laughs> um, yes, there are many there are many discussions about that, and um, and with and as it is with all donations, actually, um, if you have members in the family who have objections against donating materials to the archives, please work it out beforehand because once these things are there, and once we have preserved and digitized things, it's a lot harder to remedy uh, these concerns. Um, and um, in, in terms of the family trees, actually, we, we had a lengthy seminar with all of these questions. Um, the, these are really matters that uh, families need to cl clarify beforehand. Um, uh, in general, from a purely legal basis, um, these are actually not real legal concerns because names and dates and all sorts of information these days can be obtained by way of the internet 
and the, the, the issues of privacy, of, of uh, information that should not be disclosed has in past few years changed so much that it is, it is really a matter of, uh, it's a family matter, how the ones who, who preserve the family history need to be sort of clear with the members in the family that these things really should go where they are supposed to go. Thank you. Um, do you want to add something, Karen? Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go. I, I wanted to to add uh, just uh, responding to a few of the questions directly. But sure. first, add something which I forgot to say earlier um, when I spoke about um, my great grandfather being a gymnast and why that was so interesting and important to us. It's because uh, that son Ross, uh, who who looked like the gymnast's son uh, is also a, a very good athlete and with very good gymnastic uh, capabilities. So we always assume that he didn't, because even if he didn't look like the postman, that that probably was the side that he took after the <laughs> mother. Um, and the other, uh, someone asked specifically why I would give or why one would give to the Leo Beck Institute. And I just want to go back to, to the beginning and, and that is, um, when I showed this material, uh, things I showed to you, uh, Michael Simonson was able to tell me all about gym uh, societies, gym organizations, uh, gymnastic organizations, whatever, in Germany. He knew the context behind it. And, um, and Frank, when I bring something in, he can tell me all about the importance of the material that we have. And so to, have it, to know that, um, that one can get information, but also uh, people who are studying German Jewry come to the Leo Beck Institute to look for this material. If it's elsewhere, um, it might not get discovered. It might not uh, attain its significance because it's not used. So those are reasons why. Okay, so there are a lot of questions here about um, translations. Um, so I will try to summarize these as best as possible. Um, First of all, do you provide any translation services, specifically, obviously, from German, um, including old, uh, old German handwriting? Um, and uh, I'm going to keep going um, for a couple of related questions. Um, let's see. Um, should, if, if you, um, should people provide if they have it or if they're planning to make, to to hire somebody outside should they make both the english and the german language um the english translation and the original german language um should they donate both versions um and let me see if there's anything else related um one second sorry there are a lot of questions coming in which is great but it's Thank hard you. to scroll through all of them yeah. Um, let, let's just start there and I'll, yeah, who would like, uh, Frank or, or, yeah, well, or Michael, Michael, either one. Michael is probably better able to, to answer this, but, um, of course we prefer if you have already, uh, uh, have translations made that you submit both uh, the German and the English, for short, um, for short documents identifying or translating, uh, we, we can definitely help. Um, and uh, very often the information you're really looking for is a small portion of uh, certainly with official documents. So we can probably easily identify and then give you uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, information that you really are looking for. For larger bodies of texts, I mean correspondence and so on, we, we can connect you to people who do this uh, for a fee uh, because that is way beyond our capacity. But there are very good people out there who, who can do these things. But Michael may, may have more to say about this. Oh, I will. 
unmute Michael. Michael? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, so yeah, um, so we used to have a number of volunteers who uh, translated material. Um, our volunteers uh, were largely um, uh, almost completely from Germany, with one or two from Austria, and they um, could read the old handwriting, and they did a lot of good work for us. Uh, they had all come from Germany, but of course, now sadly, with the passing of time, we have we do we have very we have very few volunteers left, so we can't translate material in the amount we used to before. So now we are generally, as Frank said, uh, connecting people to others who could do translation. However, that translation is usually for a fee, the market fee, and uh, we don't really have uh, provide large free translations anymore. Though, um, uh, not, frankly, not even large paid translations anymore, really, right? Not um, really, yeah. no, mm -hmm. not really. We just don't have the uh, manpower anymore, sadly, mm -hmm. because of the age of our former volunteers. Uh, mm -hmm. Say hello to Marianne Salinger, who's one of them, who I know oh, is Marianne. listening. Oh, Marianne, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, but we can connect you with people who would be able to do it for a fee. And as Frank said, we can do small pieces and provide basic information from a handwritten or typed German document. We, we can do that. Thanks. So a quick follow-up then, if people um, have large collections that they are, let's say, planning to um, have someone translate, should they uh, wait to donate their papers or should they donate um, the originals and make copies to, to to be uh, translated, or how, I would what? choose I would choose B. Okay. Yes, and they should give they should copy the material, keep the copies, give us the originals, and work from the copies. That way, you know the original is safe because right. you know otherwise you still have the original and you're waiting and you aren't giving it to us. And um, you know uh, it's uh, we can provide, of course, security for it, a quality control, uh, a climate controlled environment, uh, catalog it, make sure we always know the location. And you know, in truth, that is safer than if you are keeping it in a shoebox um, in your basement somewhere. That's 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 not a, that's not advisable. <laughs> I understand that you know that's. Uh, uh, how, how it has to be in many cases, but it's, yeah. it's better if you copy it and then you work from that. Also, if you're sending it to someone and something happens to it or to the other person, then your original document is gone. Right. And that would be, that would be a pretty sad thing. And uh, sorry, one more quick follow up. If sure. uh, when people are ready to send the, um, let's say the translation, if they've already donated the original material, it's relatively easy to add it to their original collection. That's, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can create a link, even the catalog record to it and, and the finding names, so yes. Okay, thanks. There are so many really good questions. I know we won't be able to get to them all. Um, how, can, how can we do a follow-up so that we can answer some of these good questions? Well, I can, uh, share um, the email addresses of, of any of you, e e any of you three who would like to do that. Um, yes, you're welcome to, to send mine. Um, I mean, okay. I, I'm, I'm the, the reference person anyway. I will go ahead and put that in. Answer. I will go ahead and put that in the chat box um, right now. Let's see. Thanks. And I'll, I'll pull my, my usual line. Some of you have heard it before, but if there's anything anything that that we can be helpful to you with please please call michael <laughs> <laughs> it is true though email actually works better than calling for me because i don't always get to my messages um uh, but i always get i always get my emails Michael's wonderful better, but, but I'm happy to answer questions. Frank is happy. The staff is at your service. Um, I think that's the best way. I mean, I, I will keep a, a, a transcript of the chat. So if there's any specific questions that any of you um, would like to follow up with later, you can. But otherwise, I would encourage people to email Michael. Yep. 
Frank? I look forward to oh. them. Oh, I just said I look forward to them. <laughs> so I just want to say one last thing, because I saw in the questions about donating materials. Um, and at the moment, uh, we are closed and we are not able to accept physical donations. So we will not open before the new year. Um, so please get back in touch with us um, when, and we can back get, if you send us your emails, we can get back in touch with you to signal uh, when we will be able again to, for you to send um, materials. Because at the moment we are all working from home and there's really nobody at the office. And so therefore, um, uh, so we, we don't want to things get lost, but on the other hand, um, you know, we, we want to be the place that you, where you know that, that, you, that, that your materials will be safe. I, I want to make um, one more final comment. One of the questions is from my friend, Father Rob Carboneau, asking about actually the, the emotional aspect to, to working with this material and, and looking at this material. And I'm reminded of a session I went to at a conference with the Holocaust Memorial Museum staff uh, uh, when the museum first opened and every one of those staff people uh, became emotional when discussing what it meant to them to make this material available, to make this museum available. Leo Beck Institute is, is about life as, as much as it is about German Jewish life, as much as it is about the Holocaust and, and the period following. But, but of course, there are many emotions that we all feel when we're reading this material and, and working with it. Uh, I do cry a lot. We all cry a lot. But I'm just, uh, to me, to make it available so that it can be known is, is the gift that we're, we're giving. It's, it's not being buried with history. It's, it's being alive by doing this. So. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and as Karen mentioned very early on in the presentation, um, you never know what um, your family's collections might, um, how they might inspire other uh, researchers, how they might be useful to, to people on um, a number of levels, whether it's your own descendants coming to see them later on, or people making connections to your, you know, other branches of your family, making connections to your family, um, or um, just, you know, just gaining a, a greater understanding about uh, a variety of topics, immigration history, um, the Holocaust, obviously, um, uh, what German Jewish life was like prior to the Holocaust, um, all kinds of things that um, may not occur to you, but um, could be really meaningful to somebody else down the line. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Um, what else? Oh, I just want to, because um, a number of people have written in about non-German uh, Jewish related collections. Um, so I just want to mention that, yes, there are other partner organizations at the Center for Jewish History that collect uh, family papers and memorabilia. Um, they, those include the American Jewish Historical Society, which, as you probably guessed, uh, collects materials from American Jewish families of various backgrounds, um, and uh, and the uh, YIVO, which uh, collects materials from families of Eastern European Jewish background, and the American Sephardi Federation, which collects materials from families of Sephardi origin. So uh, they each have different collecting policies, and uh, maybe. Uh, uh, maybe doing different things during uh, than Leo, the Leo Beck Institute during this uh, period of closure. So I would recommend reaching out to each of them individually if you're interested in donating to uh, any of those uh, organizations. I will. Uh, I put I put their email addresses in the uh, uh, Q and A before, but I'll uh, add them again to the chat box now. Um, so. Does anybody else, uh, does 
Karen, do you want to answer one more question while I'm doing that? <laughs> Sure. Well, I was very happy to hear that someone else has a, a recording with birthday greetings from 1932. Uh, so uh, I don't know that anyone has really uh, done anything with this material and that topic in and of itself would be an important one. Uh, just to also comment that we do collect material from Alsace also, uh, which was one of the questions that was asked, uh, I believe. Frank, is there anything you want to say with regard to these? Inquiries from Michael? Anything else? Oh, Frank, sorry. Uh, one second. Um, I, I, I just want to point out that, um, I mean, yes, we are, we are the archives for uh, people to use historical material, but also look at Leo Beck Institute as the place where all these materials that your family has been keeping uh, after coming from the old country and um, which may not look important, but the fact that you still have kept these things and that somebody in the family thought that these were meaningful materials that have something to say, we honor this and we are, um, we are there to continue keeping these things. Because as Mariah and, and, uh, and Karen were saying, we don't know what people in future uh, will be looking at. And, um, and daily life as we have it today um, may be unimaginable to people two generations from now. And life that will happen two or three generations further back, we probably have no real idea what that was like. And these are the only things that can tell us something about it. Um, and uh, researchers become more sophisticated by thinking about how did people live and how was it different than we live today? And, uh, and that is the material that will tell us something about it. So please include it. Thank you. Okay, so I think with that, we'll wrap it up for today. Um, I wanna thank Karen, first of all, for being a wonderful guest and um, storyteller. Um, and Frank and Michael for adding all of your um, uh, knowledge uh, about the Leo Beck Institute collections and um, what you guys are doing uh, in terms of collecting and, and preserving material um, for future generations. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Um, so please feel free to reach out to uh, if for any Leo Beck Institute specific questions to Michael Simonson. I've provided the uh, email addresses of all of our other partner institutions as well. And if you have any questions about the Genealogy Institute, I will um, write our email address now in the chat box, gi at cjh.org. And we look forward to, you know, hearing from you and seeing you at future programs. So thank you again. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye.